I want to read something to you out of 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, and then we're going to go to Ephesians 2 and 8. And uh, I hope you're ready for this. I kind of, if I, if I can, if I can, I, I want to uh, have a conversation with you. Is that all right? Uh, uh, sometimes I get around here and uh, I get to jumping around and uh, uh, yelling in the microphone, but I, I want to have a conversation with you. Okay. I want to do my best to contain myself, but I want to talk to you about something, and, and I have a lot to say, so I'm going to tell you this, that I, I'm probably not going to finish all this today, uh, that we'll talk about some of this next week as, as well, amen? But in 2 Kings chapter 5, I want you to look specifically at, between verses 1 and 15. I'm going to read these uh, uh, quickly, but I, I want you to hear this story, and then we're going to go to Ephesians uh, 2 and 8, and... Um, and we're going to hear what God has to say. Ready? So in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1, here's what the Bible says. It says, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Assyria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord... Now think about this. He's a commander of the enemy. It says, By him the Lord had given victory to Syria, for he, uh, he also was a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Verse 3 says, Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were uh, with the prophet who is in Samaria for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master uh, and, and said, Thus and thus, says the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he uh, departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. <laughs> Listen to this response. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God? to kill and make alive, that this man sends a man to me to heal him of leprosy. Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. In other words, he's seeing this as a setup. <laughs> Verse 8 says, So it was when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there was a prophet in Israel. That's confidence. Verse 9 says, Then Naaman went to his uh, horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. And Elijah sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in, in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be returned to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Ab Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, Would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? That's easy. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. According to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. Now we have Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not that of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have to be in your presence to hear your word. Lord, we just ask you right now that you allow us to hear your word and hear it in the spirit. 
We ask you to write on our spirit, write on our souls the word of God that we wouldn't forget it. But I thank you that you would change us with your word, that you would empower us with your word, that you would strengthen us with your word, heal us with your word, Father. Speak to us with your word, Lord. Cause us to hear things in such a way that we know that you're speaking to us personally so we can make the changes that we need to make. Help us, Lord, to become more like you, more like your son, Jesus. And we'll be grateful for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many people know that grace is amazing? Amen. Grace is uh, amazing. It's giving us what we have not earned. It sustains us in a way uh, uh, that it gives us things that we do not and we have not deserved. Anybody glad that grace reached you wherever it is that you were? Amen. How many of us were somewhere? You know what I'm talking about? And you were somewhere, and grace had to reach you. Amen. Now, some of us, I know, some of us were born in church. <laughs> and, there, and there's, listen now, I'm not even making fun of that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm just talking about some people you know God had to reach you. Now, here's the thing, that some of us grew up right there in church, and God still had to reach us. Some of us grew up right there in church, and we were on the usher board, or we were on the choir, and we did this. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Y'all don't, don't know nothing about that. Some of us grew up like that, and God still had to reach us right there in that line. <laughs> Why were you wearing your bow tie? Y'all don't, don't know what I'm talking about. God had to reach you. Why there was a hundred women in white. God had to reach you. Amen. How many people are you just glad that God reached you? However he reached you, he reached you just glad about it. So now one of the most iconic songs concerning grace is the song Amazing Grace. And Daryl sung it so wonderfully. Let's put our hands together for uh, Daryl and the praise team. And our musicians did a great job. And so now most of us know the first few lines there that ends with uh, uh, blind, but now I see. But have you considered the rest of the song? Have you considered the rest of the song? I want to read it to you very quickly. It says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will, he, he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Yea, when this flesh and heart shall fail and mortal, mortal, mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Right. Amazing grace. This amazing grace that God has given us. And we spoke, we've been speaking about grace over the last two weeks. We spoke about how uh, efficacious grace is and how sufficient uh, grace is, how grace is the gift that keeps on giving. And you open that gift and you find out there's more in that than you thought. And you open up grace and you get salvation. And you open up salvation and you got justification. You open up justification, you find out you're redeemed. You open up the redemption, you find out you're covered. You, I mean, you just keep opening up this, this gift if you keep opening up. Some of us want to just get straight to that, that prophecy. We bypass some other things. Let's, let's spend some time in redemption before we talk about prophesying. Amen? And so then now, what would happen? What would happen if you just received grace? 
you receive grace for all of it, for all of what it is and for what all it could do in your life. I know sometimes grace does things for you even while you're fighting against it. But what would happen if you went with the current instead of against it? You could still swim against the current, but you would start moving, though, if you started swimming with the current. You understand what I'm saying? So then now what would happen if we cooperated with the grace that God has given us? Amen. I want you to think about this. According to Ephesians 2 and 8, grace is the vehicle that salvation rides in while it's on its way to us. It rides in, in this thing while it's coming to us. And we receive this salvation uh, through grace. We receive Jesus uh, through, excuse me, through faith. Amen. And so then now we understand, but it's not by works. And so it's not by my performance. This grace is a gift that comes from God. It's a gift that comes from God. It's a free gift. Now, this pushes me further uh, to consider that I have not done anything to get it. I have not earned it. I have not deserved it. But here it is. It's such a wonderful thing that's come to me, and I haven't done anything to get it. You know, uh, we, we, as children, even though you knew your birthday was coming up and there's nothing necessarily you did to get to your birthday, you begin to act really good, uh, right, you know, right around your birthday because you're trying to get something from <laughs> knowing that they've already planned something for, you understand? But so you, you're just trying to make sure that you don't nullify or cancel whatever it is. <laughs> So now the question becomes this, why is God so committed uh, to me? Why is he so committed to you when we are not so committed to him? Now, some of us in here, I know you're, you're very, very committed uh, to God, but I'm talking about grace found me when I wasn't committed. So then I ask the question, why is God so committed to me when I'm not so committed to him? How long would you stay in a relationship with somebody who's not committed to you? How about a person who proves to you that they're not committed to you by walking out on that commitment and then coming back on that commitment and then walking out on that commitment whenever they choose to walk out on that commitment? <laughs> I'm not talking about you. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about here. And so then they don't, they don't, they don't walk out on that. See, I want you to understand something. There, there is not just they're not committed to you, but they're also not committed to them, uh, uh, to the person they walked out with. And then on top of that, they're not committed to themselves. You understand what I'm saying? They don't keep a promise to you. They don't keep a promise to that person. And they don't keep their promise to themselves. How long would you be committed to that kind of person? You would begin to feel like you're not getting anything out of that kind of relationship. And you would begin to have a decision to make. But God, who is rich in mercy, seems to come through for us in the face of opposition, in the face of us fighting against him, in the face of our condition and our disposition towards him, he still keeps coming through. Anybody glad that God just keeps coming through for you? Anybody ever have something on the altar? God, I need you to take care of this, and I'm praying for this. I came to the altar for somebody else to help me pray about this, and then after two days, you went out and you cussed somebody out. I know that's not you. So then maybe you lied about something. That's not you. you. You did something crossed your mind and you let it stay there for a while. You were with Mary J. Blige. You, you were reminiscing. Remi reminiscing over the love you had. Knowing that you, the reminiscing that you were doing wasn't about your husband or your wife. You know what I'm talking about? And so then now you got to realize in that moment you just committed adultery because that's what Jesus said. So then now you got to deal with that you just sinned. And so then now you, you, you know, but then God just keeps staying. Now you had something on the altar though, but then you know you just sinned. And now you're thinking that the thing that's on the altar is in jeopardy. But God is rich in mercy. Answering prayers before you ask them. Knowing who you are and knowing that you were going to do and knowing what you were going to let roll through your mind still have already worked out how it is that he's going to answer that prayer because he's so committed. Are you understanding? I want you to think about how grace works. Grace doesn't work because you work it. Grace works because God is working it. Amen. 
Uh, James Stewart, a minister of the Church of Scotland, he wrote this while contemplating uh, Psalm 68 and 18, which says uh, that he, that he being Jesus, led captivity captive, all right? Here's what he said, in the, and I quote, it is a glorious phrase. Uh, the very triumphs of his foes, it means, he used for their defeat. He compelled their dark achievements to subserve his end, not theirs. They nailed him to the tree, not knowing that by that very act, they were bringing the world to his feet. They gave him a cross, not guessing that he would make it a throne. They flung him outside the gates to die, not knowing that in that very moment, they were lifting up all the gates of the universe to let the king come in. They thought to root out his doctrines, not understanding that they were implanting imperishably in the hearts of men the very name they intended to destroy. They thought they had uh, defeated God with his back to the wall, pinned and helpless and defeated. They did not know that it was God himself who had tracked them down. He did not conquer in spite of uh, the dark mystery of evil. He conquered through it. He conquered through it. God conquered through it. He conquered through our fighting. He conquered through opposition and hostility uh, towards him. He conquered through all these things. You understand? But now the question for me still becomes why? Why go through all these things? Why not just say, you know what? I'm getting tired of this. I'm getting tired of those folks. I'll just make me again another vessel. I'll just wipe them all out and just do whatever I want from the beginning. I'll just do it all over again. David ponders this question in Psalm uh, uh, chapter 8, verses 3 through 6. He, he says this, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him, for you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. What is a man that you are even thinking about him? that you let him roll through your mind, that you take care of him, that you see about him, that you crown him with glory and honor, that you put all things under his feet. What is man? Are you understanding? Now that brings me to this question, well, who am I? Who am I? Who am I that God would do this thing? Who am I that God would send his son to die for me? Even if he was just going to get one, and if it was just going to me, who am I that God would send his son to die on a cross? You understand? Who am I anyway? Any, anybody ever thought about that? Who am I? Who am I? I know myself. I never talk about me. I know myself, and I know what the things that I've done. I know the things that I've said. I know the things that I said yesterday. I know what the things that I thought yesterday. Who am I that God would do these things? But now the question becomes this. A better question is, who is God? Who is God? Now, if you think about who you are, well, who is God? And more specifically, who are you to God? And then now if you take that further, who is God to you? <laughs> Let's think about man's first encounter with God. Man's first encounter with God is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And it says this, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He became a living soul. Now, according to John chapter 4, John is a, uh, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so then when God made Adam, he made him a body. But he breathed, he got down to where Adam was and breathed into his nostrils his spirit. And so then now here for an instant, for an instant, for a moment, Adam was a body that is possessing a spirit. But when the spirit then filled that body, he became a living soul. When he fills that body, he becomes a living soul. And so now here's Adam who stands with his body. But he's not the body. He's the soul. But what he has that's invigorating the soul is a spirit that comes from God. And so a part of Adam is not Adam. There's a part of Adam that is God. 
And so then now, here's the thing. When you consider these types of things, now I got to consider this. When God speaks to you, when God speaks to me, he's speaking, because God is spirit, he's speaking to my spirit. And so then now, when he wants to tell me something, he tells me something through the spirit. And so then now I got to understand that God is communicating spirit to spirit. And so then now when I hear something, I want to hear it in the spirit. If I'm going to see something that God wants to show me, I got to see it in the spirit. When I pray, I want to pray in the spirit. When I walk, I want to walk by the spirit. If I'm going to have faith, I want to have faith by the spirit. I want to have faith by what I can do. I want to have faith by what I can't do because of what God can do. And if I can't do it in my flesh, it must be able to be done in the spirit are you understanding if i want to fight if i got to fight i got to fight in the spirit and so that if i got to fight in the spirit it better be a good fight <laughs> the bible says fight the good fight of faith and if i'm going to fight the good fight of faith it's got to be done by the spirit everybody understanding this and so if I consider now 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 3 through 5, it says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought uh, to the obedience of Christ. And so then now I got to understand that if I'm going to... So it, it, I, though I'm walking in the flesh, I'm not warring after the flesh. It's, this thing is a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual war, warfare. The person that I'm looking at really isn't my enemy. There's an enemy that I'm fighting that might be within or around that person that's happening in the spirit. I got to stop fighting these people. People talking about your haters, your haters. Your, it, well, that might not be it. It might be that they really love you, but they can't get past some stuff. And so then now the enemy that I'm facing really isn't the enemy that I see. It's an enemy that I can't see and that is happening in the spirit. Are you, are you understanding this? And so then now I got to rely on what God says. He said that this is, if I'm going to do this, it can't be by power and it can't be by might. It's got to be by my spirit. Somebody say it's all in his spirit. I want you to do something now. I just want you to trust me on this. If, if I say something, I want you, if I ask you to look at your neighbor from, from now on, I want you to do something. I want you to stand up and point at somebody and then say whatever it is that I say. Are you willing to do that? Because this thing is about the spirit, right? So then here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at your neighbor right now and say, it's all in the spirit. Y'all didn't follow directions. Now, point at them again and say, you're lazy, you're lazy, you're lazy. Get, it's the spirit. I come against that spirit of laziness. <laughs> All right, sit down, sit down. So then now, it, it, the thing is, it's about that y'all thought you were going to get away with it. It's about the spirit. It's about the spirit. Amen? And so then now, if I'm going to fight in the spirit, then I need armor. And so then if I need armor, I need a helmet. And this helmet is a helmet of salvation. It protects my mind. And so if I'm going to have on, i got to have something that's going to protect all my, my, my inward parts. You understand what I'm saying? That's the breastplate of, of righteousness. Is it, this thing is going to protect my, my heart. You understand? i got to have all these things all put together. So i got to have a belt of truth to keep it all together. And so then my loins need to be girded about with truth. Amen? If i, I got to have something on my feet. The feet got to be shot with the gospel of peace. Amen? The gospel of peace. And so then now I got this, this armor, but above all, I got to take the shield of faith. And this thing is able to quench the fiery darts that are coming to me through the spirit. But then now I have this other thing, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now think about this, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus put it this way in John 6 and 63. He says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And so then if the words that Jesus speaks are the words of God, and then the words of God are spirit in our life, then I got to understand this. Whenever I interact with the word of God, I'm interacting with his spirit and I'm interacting with life. Are you understanding this? 
So when I open up the book in early in the morning or late at night or whenever I do it, if I'm driving in my car and I let the book talk to me, are you getting what I'm saying? I open up my Bible app and I just hit play and then start driving. And this thing is speaking to me that I'm hearing something in the spirit. Now, my body might not understand, but there's a part of me part of him in me that's understanding that is giving information to my soul and my soul is understanding something that my ears may not understand what they're hearing just now but then after a while something becomes clear because it's becoming clear by the spirit are you are you understanding this and so then now I'm hearing something and now what I receive if I'm going to receive it in the spirit I got to receive it now by faith I got to receive it by faith. And so now here comes Roman 10 uh, and 17. It says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But the word of God is spirit and it is life. And so then if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, then I can understand this. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by his spirit and life. So then now, if I, if I, if I, I wanna, uh, if I change it now, and I look in a different translation, I look in the complete Jewish Bible, it reads this way. So trust comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through a word proclaimed about the Messiah. If I change that again, and I look in the, the Passion Translation, it says this, and I love this. Faith, then, is birth in a heart that responds to God's anointed utterance of the anointed one. So then the words that I'm hearing, I got to believe, are the words of God. Now, here's what I understand. John 1 and 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the same was in the beginning. What I'm talking about then is there, there were no Bibles in the beginning. It was the word, and the word wasn't a what, it was a who. And so then now when I'm receiving the word of God, I'm receiving a who, and this word of God I'm receiving that's a who is in the spirit, and it is life. Which is why John, when he was writing about Jesus, said, now, now this was not the light, <laughs> but he was the light, and the light, that he was the life of men. Now what I'm trying to explain to you is what I'm receiving by the word is spirit, and it is life, and I got to receive it now by the spirit, and I got to hear it, and then and now I'm hearing it. And now this thing that's stirring up in me that's being birthed in me is faith. And I need faith to believe because the spirit is moving so much faster than the natural. So then when I pray, God heard it and answered already. Matter of fact, if I really want to tell the truth, God answered before I heard, before I spoke it. You get what I'm saying? And so he went in front of me and then answered it and went back words in time and told me to pray for it so it will be released in the earth because it happened by the spirit this is why when God said in the spirit <laughs> who shall go for us and Jesus said I'll go so the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world through the spirit but the natural slower so in the process of time, then Jesus was born, but he was already slain. Whew. And so then now I'm part of this wonderful legacy of what's been happening in the spirit. Are you understanding? So then now if I receive by faith. Now, if I receive by faith, now this thing changes my heart. And if it changes my heart, it changes my intention. If it changes my intention, now it changes my will. And if it changes my will, now if it changes my will, then I'm all consumed by this faith that I have because now I'm responding to everything by my will. I'm responding by my will, which is the seat of my decision. And so then now here's what's happening. Because this is the seat of my decision and I'm responding, by the will that has been changed by faith that I received by the spirit <laughs> now I'm bringing my body under subjection under the will of God because my will have changed are oh, you understand what I'm saying so now I bring my body under subjection to the will that is under subjection to the will of God so I bring my body under subjection to the will of the spirit 
even though it's living right here in the natural. And so then now while I'm submitted to the will of God, now there's something else that's been birthed in me, and that is an I will. I will. I will. Are you, are you, are you getting what I'm saying? Look at somebody and say, just receive. I just want to see if you're going to follow directions. That's all. I just want to see if you're going to follow directions. Only some of y'all stood up. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Naaman. So then now, now here's what the, the Bible says. It says, now, if I understand that I will, I will, I will. So then now it's not just that I will do this or I'm trying to make a promise, but I'm talking about I will, I, I will it. And so then now I will bless the Lord at all times. Are you get what I'm saying? No matter what my situation is and what, what I'm going through, I will, I will bless the Lord at all times. I, I, I will call upon the name of the Lord. Now think about this, that I will, not just I promise or I shall or I, I think I'm going to, but I will. So then it's like this. So yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will. I will feel, fear no evil for you are with me. You, you get what I'm saying? Look at somebody right now and say, I will. I will. Oh, y'all, y'all, y'all. Look at that. Look at the repentant hearts working. I will. I, I will do it. I will do it. Now, when this will is then birthed in you, you got to understand something. That when you begin to will like that, you become unstoppable. Once you get past that first I will... You get what I'm saying? Sometimes we just get, let me put it to you like this. Sometimes you just got to go to the gym that first time. Just get it out of the, you just got to get it out of the way. And let me just get up and I will, I will, I will. <laughs> I know I'm not talking to you now. I will go. I will get up and go. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bring my body under subjection. Because I got grandchildren to see and great grandchildren. So I will. I will. Are you get what I'm saying? Well, now, okay, now let me put it, to you, I'll put it to you like this. So then now, if you got that kind of I will, you got the kind of I will that other people had in the scripture. Amen? Then, then Jesus was preaching in a house. And while he was preaching in a house and people's lives were being changed and people being healed by the word of God, there were other people who were outside who wanted to get in and couldn't get in. And so there was another person that was laying there and he was lame. I'm just telling this story real quick. And what happened is he has some good friends. Anybody know what it means to have some good friends? Some people you can really depend on? And so then he wanted to get in but couldn't get in because it was so crowded because the word of God was moving in the spirit. Are you getting what I'm saying? But he has some good friends that were committed to him. What I'm saying is that he was down in his life. You got some people who will leave you when you're down. You got some people who will kick you while you're down. But you got some other people in your life who will help you while you're down. And these people had an I will in their spirit that became unstoppable. And they began to lift this brother up. Not to get through the door, but let's lift them all the way up to the roof. Somebody had an idea, we can't get in through the door, we can't get in through the window, and there's nowhere else that we could get in. Why don't we just tear a hole in the roof? And the three other friends didn't think that was crazy. They had an I will in their spirit. They said, let's do it. And he said, well, then I'm on for the journey. Lift me up. Are you kidding what I'm saying? And the five of them got up on that roof and tore a hole in the roof. Now, now I got to be thinking if I'm in the service, I'll be thinking I'm blessing the Lord and looking at Jesus and receiving and my life is being changed. And I'm seeing something crumbling and feeling what is on my head. No, no, I'm trying to explain to you what I will be doing. I would have been snatched right out of the spirit. And I'm thinking, is that, oh, they got, they got some critters. <laughs> but they tore a hole in the roof and then think about this the person was lame and so it's just a bunch of dead weight they then lowered him that's a whole lot of I will that would tear a roof a hole in the roof and lay, and Jesus said look at their faith look at their faith he didn't leave from out of the spirit because this thing was happening in the spirit. While all those other things was happening for all those other people, you had people on, they, they were on the outside and wanting to look in and they found a way by getting in the roof of the situation. 
coming through the ceiling of the ce- You got to make up your mind, and I don't care how it's going to get done. God, if you're with me, show me a way. Am I talking to anybody at all? Show me a way. And this has to be our response to the goodness God has given us through grace and his son, Jesus Christ. Our response, though, doesn't save us. It's not our response that saves us. It's not our I will that saves us. But like like Daryl was singing, it's his blood. It's his blood that accomplished that. Yet our cooperation with the free gift of Christ, if received, now yields great reward. Because God said of himself that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Look at somebody and say, just receive. Just receive. Just receive. Y'all getting this thing now. Just receive. Look, if you can't stand up, I understand. Just lift one hand. Hey, look, I understand your situation. Everybody got something else, something different going on. You got to do what you got to do. Find a way. Now, look, I want you to consider Naaman for a second. Consider Naaman. He is the commander of the enemy's uh, army. But grace was working. Grace was working when he raided the cities of Israel. Grace was working when he took captive a young girl. See, now, I don't want to deal with all the implications and the reason why and what we think is fair and unfair. I just want to tell you that fair and unfair didn't matter to you when grace was working in your life. But grace was working when he took captive a young girl. Grace was still working when he gave that young girl to his, uh, uh, his wife to, to serve. Grace was still working when the, when the little girl noticed him that he was leprous. Grace was still working. Are you get what I'm saying? Grace was still working when she opened up her mouth and said, Now, if you just had been in Israel, had you just been in Samaria, there's a prophet there. <laughs> Grace was still working. Grace is working trying to get to Naaman. And so he's got to get to Naaman. Now, however he's got to get to Naaman, God is going to get to Naaman, even if it means that Naaman has to become an enemy of God. Raid the cities of his people. Take captive a young girl to notice the fact that he's sick. So she can say out of her mouth, there is a prophet. I don't know your situation and how God brought you through, but I want you to understand something is that God did whatever it took. He did whatever it took to get you to a place to hear from him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so then now grace was still working when he had favor with both kings and grace was still working when it brought him in front of Elijah's door. And now here's what happens in 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, I want you to consider Naaman for a second. In verses 10 through uh, 13, or verse, verse 10, it says, And Elijah sent a messenger to him. He didn't come out. He sent a messenger and said, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Verse 11 says, But Naaman became furious and went away and said, I said to myself that he's going to come out here and make a spectacle and uh, start speaking in tongues and lay hands on me and pour oil all over me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet, and I was going to lay out in the floor. I was going to I was going to be slain in the spirit and they were going to have to pick me up and somebody going to say put him back down and pick me up and say put him back down. This is what Naaman was saying. He said I was I thought he was going to come out here maybe because after all I am who I am he should have come out. In other words pride was standing in opposition of grace. And sometimes we let guilt and shame stand in opposition of grace. You're too guilty to receive grace and too shameful to receive grace. And grace is coming and you don't earn it or don't deserve it. But we think we got to earn grace and we got to deserve grace. Or because what you did a long time ago, that grace can't come uh, to you. Or how grace is coming. You don't want it to come that way. You want it to come another way. You, You get what I'm saying? But grace finds a way to get you however it needs to get you. And so now here it is coming to Naaman, and Naaman is opposing grace. I know none of us have ever opposed grace. We never stood in opposition against grace, but we got to learn how to lay these things down so that we can receive grace. Are you understand what I'm saying? Now, so and here's, here's what happens. Now, he had some good friends around him. Now, it says that they were his servants, but, it, but now it, he, he must have, and uh, uh, my wife and I were talking about this, he, he must have created a safe space around them so they could come and talk to him. And he said this, he said that, uh, uh, now, now, Father, I just want to talk to you for a second. If the prophet had asked you to do something great, 
would you have done it? <laughs> that made Naaman think. If he asked you to do something wonderful, would you have uh, done it? Would you have, would you have done it? Uh, if he asked you to do, now see, now here, here's the thing now. I, I'm not, I'm not at, no, I want to be very clear about this. I'm not asking for this. I'm not asking for this. But if I, if I asked you to come up here and put $20 in the altar and God's going to bless you, would you do it? Or would you go, see, there go preachers. That's why I don't like church right there. That right there. What's the difference between you and Naaman? However, God's got to get it to you. What difference does it, does it make? You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And so then now, so then now I got to, I got, when I'm looking at this, he's, then the servant says, how much more than when he says to you, wash and be clean? So then now is really about an issue of the will. Will he do this or will he not do this? Will I receive the grace of God? Will I receive salvation? Will I receive uh, a Jesus? Look at somebody right now and say, are you willing? Are you willing? Are you willing to receive? You will... Are you willing? <laughs> Are you willing to receive? So I think some of y'all are starting to get this now. Are you willing? Are you willing uh, uh, to to receive? See, because here's the thing: when he was receiving the words, the word was saying to him, "Now go wash in 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 uh, uh, in Jordan. I want you to go dip in there." seven times. I want you to go in there and dip seven times. Now, here's the thing: you got to understand: the Jordan was dirty. So when Naaman was uh, objecting it, he was thinking about himself and his status and saying, I don't want to go in the dirty waters of Jordan. Why not? Why not go into Damascus where the, where the, where the far part is, these lovely rivers? See, because Damascus is higher than where uh, Samaria was in that, in that place where they were. And so it flowed down. And because of what they were doing, it got dirtier as it... <laughs> It went dirtier as it went. He didn't want to go in the, in the filth of his own people. Why should I go there? I should go to the waters of where I come from. But God is trying to tell you that you don't belong where you come from. I am, pl I am glad to be born in the United States of America. I'm glad to be an American citizen, but I am more glad to be a citizen of the kingdom. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because it's, 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 it's now what I'm trying to explain to you is, is, is this, is this. I want you to understand it's the words that he was receiving from uh, uh, Elijah where they were, they were God's words. And so that means it was spirit and it was life. It wasn't about what was happening in his flesh. It was about what was happening in the spirit. And so I need you to make your flesh do this seven times because it's not about your flesh, but it's about something that's happening in your spirit. I'm doing something else in your spirit, so I need to make your flesh uncomfortable. But some of us aren't willing to make our flesh uncomfortable. We think, we think all of us got to be uncomfortable. Well, now flesh is warring against the spirit. And so somebody's got to be uncomfortable for the other one to work. So if your flesh is still comfortable, then it must be your spirit is a little stressed out. Are you... <laughs> but if you're making your flesh uncomfortable, I guarantee you that your spirit is thriving. Are you getting what I'm saying? So he now, now he has to go and, and do this thing. And so then now uh, these words that God are giving him, they are spirit and they are life. Look at somebody and say, just receive. Just receive. Just receive. That's all I'm saying. I'm just saying just, just receive because you receive it uh, by faith. Now, here's the thing. I, I want you to understand something about Naaman. <laughs> Naaman had to get over what he wants. So, so now God could do something for him based on who he was becoming. Naaman had to get over what he was for God to do in him uh, what it is that he was making him. And so now he had to dip in the, uh, in the Jordan seven times. And what I'm explaining to you is this. He dipped in there the first time. And I'm wondering if I was him, I probably would have looked at myself right away. And I was, oh, okay, let me get right back in. And so, because it must be how many, I must be, I must get better and better. But that's not how it worked. That's not how it worked. He said, dip seven times and then you'll be healed. <laughs> dip seven times 
then you'll be healed. And so now, I don't know about you, but after the fourth time, I'd have been thinking, now this ought to be working uh, uh, some way, shape, or form. See, but what happens is this. Naaman finished. He kept on going. But many of us, we stop after number four. This still didn't work. Forget it. I'm done with this. I'm done with church. I'm done with y'all Christians. I walked that, I walked in that, that path. How many other people walk that same path? I'm through, I'm through with it. I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm done. You understand? But it wasn't until after what the prophet said. It wasn't until after the word was completed. Some of us, I'm just trying to explain to you, you're right on the other side of just letting the word get completed in your life. Don't give up now. Do you understand what I'm saying? But it was after the seventh time, then it was him being healed. Now, now I don't know about you, but if you have been counting, I've had you stand up and sit down six times. But some of y'all thought you were smarter than God. <laughs> I was just trying to help you. I asked you if you brought $20 up here, would you do it? You said yes, and some of us couldn't stand up. <laughs> I'm talking about God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. Look, now here's the thing. The, the, those that did it every time, everybody else is at six. I, now, here's the thing that's wonderful about God and God's grace and his mercy. He can cause you to catch up whenever you feel like it. But you got to have an I will in your spirit. Because while you, thank you. Because while your mind, while your mind is saying to yourself that I, uh, I don't take all that. It's not about what's happening in your flesh. It's about what's happening in the spirit. You got it. Some of y'all, y'all, some of y'all getting this thing. It's the, the thing that's wonderful about repentance is this, is that you turn away from what it is that you were thinking and you begin to walk in the thing that God gave you. And the thing that God gave you is what he gave you by the spirit. Y- y'all getting it now. Some of y'all, some of y'all getting it now. Some of y'all playing catch up right now. You, you're understanding. Now, don't think that standing up that one time is the time that takes care of all the times you didn't do it. It's about following the Word of God. Are you understanding what I'm saying? It's about understanding what the Word of God is saying in the Spirit because what the Word of God is saying, those words are Spirit and they are life. Are are you understanding this? So what I'm trying to explain to you is this. What if I was to tell you that the next time you stood up and sit down, that God's breakthrough was yours, that your blessing was on the way? What if I told you the next time you stood up and sat right back down that your miracle was apparent? What if I told you that God was going to answer your prayer the next time you stood up and sat down for the seventh time? That if you did it the seventh time that God was going to make something wonderful happen in your life? What if I told you next time you stood up and sat down he was going to save your brother? That he was going to save your sister? That he was going to save your children? That he was going to make sure that your grandchildren are covered in the blood? What if I told you if you stood up and sat down for the seventh time that that all the things that you were thinking could never be done were all going to come into fruition? What if I told you the next time you stood up and sat back down that your healing was going to come to you? Are you understand what I'm saying? Somebody just praise the Lord right now. Just respond with just a little bit of praise. Just Just give God a great big hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What if the next time you obey God, that he made you whoever you're supposed to be in the spirit? This thing is about the spirit. Look at somebody and say, this thing is about the spirit. This thing is about the spirit. It's not about what's happening in your body. It's not about what's happened in your past. It's about what's happening in the spirit right now, right now. It's about the spirit, the spirit, the spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now I could go a little further, but but I'm not. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop right here. We're gonna pick up, we're gonna pick this up. We're gonna pick this up. 
But I want to tell you this. I want to tell you this. I want to tell you this. Because y'all are going to keep me going. I don't want you to keep me going. Y'all take your seats. Y'all doing well. <laughs> I want you to understand this. Naaman wanted his skin to be healed. Naaman wanted his skin to be healed. But God was healing his heart. Naaman wanted his disease to be healed. That was happening in his body. But God was cleansing his soul. Because it wasn't about what was happening in his body. It's about what's happening in the spirit. Are you, are you getting this? Let me put it to you like this. In verse 15 of 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman said, now I know that there is no other God in all the earth except for the God in Israel. Are you understanding? God was taking him from who he was and changing him into who he was to become because it was about what was happening in the spirit. Naaman just had to receive grace. He had to cooperate. I'm going to read something to you and, and, and we're going to pick up next week. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 17 and 19, and this is the last scripture here, 17 and 19. It says, so Naaman said, because he wanted to give Elijah a gift, and Elijah said, no, I'm not going to take it. He says, then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. That's a heart change. Verse 18 says, yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant, when my master goes into the temple of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Rimmon. Because now remember, he's a commander in the army. He's under orders. And now he's dealing with the king of Syria. And the king of Syria worships another god. And he's under authority. And so he said, now when I go into this temple, when I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord please, you hearing this? Pardon your servant in this thing. Then he said to him, go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. Now it would seem to me, everything about that, Seems like it goes against everything that should deal with grace. But God was extending grace to him anyway. That even though he was going into the temple of Rimmon to bow down in front of another God, the God he was bowing down for, for in his heart was the God of Israel. So he asked for pardon. In other words, he asked for grace. The prophet said to him, go in peace. Next week, here's what we're going to talk about. Now we got to go from receiving grace to now get on the other side. You got to be Elijah. You got to minister grace. Can you minister grace to your enemy? Now think about, this is the prophet Elijah. He could call down fire to burn him up so that Israel will go free. But could you minister grace to your enemy? It's amazing to me. Sometimes when I hear people talk and they're really harsh on somebody for what it is that they have done, what it is, whatever sin that they committed. 
And then at the same time, but brother, you, you know what you did. Can I talk to you real plain? Well, brother, you know, you know what you did. Why then now you're saved and you're so hard on them? When God was gracious to you. Now and then when you deal with your family and your friends, and then they're being hard on somebody, now you know them. And you know what they did. And sometimes you know what they did against you. And now you're puzzled because how is it that you did this to me? And I forgave you, and we're good. But then now they got to pay. Saints, we got to learn how to minister grace. What we receive, we have not earned. What we receive, we have not deserved. We ought to do this. Give that same grace to, this, to another person who has also not earned it. And they have not deserved it. This is how the body is edified in love. By speaking the truth in love. Let's all stand. And we'll finish that next week. Amen. Amen. Look at somebody right now and say, you're receiving grace. Now look at that same person and say, minister that same grace. Minister that same grace to somebody. You might have somebody in your mind right now that you know, you know what? I need to give them some grace. Anybody got somebody like that in your mind right now? You already know. I need to give them some grace. I need to give them some grace. Especially if you know you haven't been giving them grace. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you just to lay them out in front of God right now. Just by using both hands. Just lay them out. Who, whoever that is. Or whoever it is that you know needs some grace. Whether they need it from you. They just need it from God. It's all coming from God anyway. And I'm going to pray for all of us. You ready? Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the hearts and minds that have been lifted up to you. Lord, I thank you that you allowed us to receive your grace. We haven't earned it. We haven't deserved it. There's nothing that we could do, Lord, to get more of it. Lord, you just poured it out on us, and we thank you. But, Lord, there's this person that I have that I'm laying in front of you right now. This person that I may have been critical over, I may have been tough on, I may have been, or maybe I just haven't thought about them much, and I should be thinking about them, I should be considering them, or maybe this person has made, they have, they have, they've angered me, God, they have done something to me that was unfair, they've done something to me, Lord, I just ask you right now, that you give them grace. Give them the same grace that you gave me. Pour it out on them like you poured it out on me. Lord, you didn't have to save me, but you did. Lord, I ask you right now that you save their soul. Lord, I ask you that you make them whole. You made me whole, Lord. I ask you to do the same thing for them. Lord, you bless me in times where I shouldn't have even been blessed, Lord. Lord, I ask you that you give a blessing to them in their life, Lord, that they would know that it was you. Lord, mercy reigned in my life. When I deserved justice, you gave me mercy. Lord, I ask you right now that you would give them mercy. Give them mercy also. The same blood, Lord, that reached down into the lowest places and got me. Lord, I ask you, Lord, to let that same blood get them, Lord. Not so I could gloat over them, talk about how God got them, but how we could rejoice together that we're going to the same place. 
Help us to minister grace one to the other, Lord. Lord, I thank you for every home that's represented, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Keep them, sanctify them, make them whole. I thank you that you add a blessing to their life, Lord, that you would give them miracles beyond their imagination, Lord, that you will bless them on their jobs, give them promotions and raises, Lord. Do whatever it is that you want to do, Lord, but we ask you to do this, to show up and be God for us, and we'll be forever grateful for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.